Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another exciting night of NBA basketball. With the first pick, the Detroit Pistons select Cade Cunningham from Oklahoma State University. Did Chandler again? Oh, what a block by Max Seal! My goodness! The Pistons are digging in. They got the depth. They got the big men. They got the better basketball team. No doubt about it. There's Jaden playing the passing lane. Sky's a jam. Dunk and the crowd loves it. Pistons need a three and they have just under three seconds to do it. Here's Chauncey Phillips. Here it is. He's got it. He's got it. Chauncey Phillips hits the three. Overtime. Amazing. Out of bounds. Detroit Basketball. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast brought to you by I Believe Aaron Johnson. With you here this week, taking over the hosting duties for Mike Anguilano. But joining me, my co-host this week, none other than my good friend Jasper Apollonia. Jasper, how are we doing? Oh, buddy, I am back here in sunny, freezing Michigan. I couldn't be happier. I might just, uh, you know I, you know what I'm thinking about, man? I got a little free time. I might head on down to District Detroit. I hear they have, like, what, 10 blocks of just all these amazing shops and restaurants How's that coming along? I haven't I haven't been back here for a while, but I'm assuming since it's been 10 years since they broke ground that, you know, it's coming along pretty good, right? Yeah, the 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 promises from from the Illich family have have, you know, really paid off. It's a great scene down there. Totally safe and and totally uh built out and designed as oh, yeah. we showed years and years ago. Aaron, Aaron, are you a Cohen Brothers fan by any chance? I promise this is going somewhere. I can't say that I am. Oh, one of my favorite movies of theirs is called A Serious Man. And there's this guy and he's just going through this existential turmoil in his life. And he goes to a rabbi and the rabbi tells him, just look out into the parking lot, Larry. Look how beautiful it is. Look how pristine. Just look at that parking lot. <laughs> Something tells me Chris Illich, his favorite movie is A Serious Man. Concrete Chris, baby. Let's go. Yeah, nothing like those fifty dollar parking parking uh, lots when you're trying. to Yeah, get- but but Aaron, there's a ton of them. So that's uh, actually a hint to later in the show. We're going to be talking about something related to that. I think it's an interesting topic, but not a whole lot going on with the Pistons this week. So going to be a bit of a shorter show. Uh, we're going to be talking about the coaching search and how the Detroit Pistons fan base and Little Caesars Arena ranked in. Uh, an NBA player poll that ranked the best and worst uh, fan base arenas to play in. So we're going to be talking about that uh, throughout this week's show. But before we get into all of that, I want to talk about this week's sponsor, Bet Online. BetOnline.ag is your number one source for all of your basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest player reports for this year's pro basketball playoffs. Bet online is always your sports information headquarters this season, as we have you covered for all your sports wagering needs. Baseball, MLB, NHL hockey, right to UFC and boxing. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games you can play right from your home. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Be sure to use our promo code BLEAV, B L E A B, to receive your 50% welcome bonus. On your first deposit, bet online where the game starts. To to anybody who bet on the Bucks losing to the Miami Heat in five, congratulations on that new down payment you put on your house. That must be nice. Jimmy Butler is insane. I just incredible the performance that that he put on throughout that entire series. Uh, and I think it almost gets lost in in the story because so much has happened in the NBA and there's been so many injuries, but Miami, Miami did that without Tyler hero, who is what their third best player. You know, yeah. that's not an insignificant loss in that process for them. And last night, even in like the first minute of OT, they had Kyle Lowry, um, uh, Bam Adebayo and Kevin Love all followed out. It, incredible, incredible game. Um, I have to say though, Jimmy Butler avoiding the, uh, this guy is a fraud in the regular season charges is incredible because this guy elevates his game so much for the playoffs 
that you're like, he's got to be dogging it during the regular season. But nobody cares that he load manages. Everybody wants to talk about Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. I think it's funny, man. Jimmy Butler's got the best scam going in the NBA right now. He is a completely, completely different player in, in the playoffs. And I think you know, I think part of that, you know, a guy like Kawhi Leonard gets gets caught up in that more because he's missed consecutive years. You know, he sits more games. Like Jimmy Butler does tend to play more games, but also it seems like he's coasting through those games. Just, I, just when you see him in the playoffs, comparing that to his regular season style yeah. of play, it's just a complete you, player. You don't fear him in the regular season like you do in the playoffs. You don't, you, you don't worry about Jimmy Butler so much when you're playing the heat in the regular season, but it's a different game. A lot of guys like to talk about playoff mode. Only a few of them can actually engage it. So ready to be seen if the Pistons have a couple guys that can engage playoff mode, but hopefully we'll be seeing that soon. As also, I- we'll hopefully be seeing whether that head coach is going to be happening quicker than expected since Charles Lee and the Bucks are now out of the playoffs, Aaron, right? Yeah, I was uh I'm looking here at my computer where I'm on a a website that has so, a Pistons related article up and it's plastered with uh locking your season tickets for the 2023-2024 season. Uh it's got banners and and text on the page all throughout it. Uh as we get as we're already talking about next season, which is, is crazy to even think about because we're still in the playoffs of this season and a very good first round uh, of NBA playoffs, mind you. The Pistons are apparently starting to narrow down their head coaching list. They do have some more interviews that are, have been scheduled out apparently throughout this week. But according to James Edwards of The Athletic, uh, per team and league sources, the Pistons have emerged three front runners for their head coaching position currently that being the Milwaukee Bucks assistant coach Charles Lee New Orleans Pelicans assistant coach Jerron Collins and Kevin Ali the head coach of overtime elite are the early front runners for the Detroit Pistons head coaching position Jasper these three names I think are works we're, we're pretty expected when you started to see the list of guys come out that the Pistons were going to interview. I think maybe the most surprising is Collins. Uh, But what what are your thoughts on on these three names being the the quote unquote early front runners for the the head coaching position here in Detroit? Yeah. I mean, Kevin Ollie is an interesting one because he's certainly not the guy that you would expect to take your team, a young team like this, somebody with, no NBA head coaching experience. I, I could be mistaken. Does he even have any assistant coaching experience in the NBA? Yes, he does. He was oh, a- oh, 2010. He was with the Thunder, right? Yeah, he was with the Thunder. Right. It was right after he had retired. Excuse me. But still, that's been a long time. And the way things ended for him at UConn was not exactly incredible. Uh, that is definitely one that has surprised me. That being said, I have heard from somebody that I very much trust that it's not a smokescreen. And obviously they wouldn't be bringing him back in for a second interview if it was a smokescreen. It's very surprising. Jerron Collins is not somebody that we had initially on our list, but the more I'm hearing about him, especially in terms of what he's done defensively as an assistant, I really like that because That is a part of this team that anybody who watched this team at any point in the season knows that is their number one thing they have to improve. The offense, yes, of course, but the defense is simply not good enough. That's not going to get you to the playoffs. So you need a coach who's going to be able to come in, improve your young players defensively, coach them up, your guys like James Wiseman, your guys like Jalen Duran, Jaden Ivey young, impressionable guys with room to grow defensively and the talent to do it. On the other hand, I think then you also look at somebody like Charles Lee, who is absolutely a trusted assistant in Milwaukee, has been talked about for a couple of years, and seems like he is one of those guys that is just destined to be a head coach, if not for Detroit, then for somebody else. So I will actually say I do like the mix of candidates. I think we all were disappointed that Emu Doka was not on that list uh, for Detroit. 
But more so than that, even if I'm not necessarily sold on the names, I'm also willing to admit that I am not a head coach expert. I am not somebody that has inside information to these locker rooms and these training sessions. I don't know. But what I like to see is that you have three guys with varying levels of experience and varying uh, areas of expertise. I think that that's definitely a good thing. You need to see where you're going to go. What is the priority for growing your team into a playoff contender in the years to come? So correction here, Kevin Ali went straight to UConn after playing his final season with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Oh, okay. In ten. Then he yeah. went to be an assistant at UConn for a few years become, before becoming the head coach here. Or excuse me, become, before becoming the head coach there. Um, yeah, I think this list for me is a bit – underwhelming isn't, I guess, the right term because I don't necessarily think it's fair to say that when – I get it sounds like they haven't interviewed all of their guys yet or gone through the second interview st stage with all of the guys that they're interested in yet. Uh, and maybe this is just how the schedule came out out of that group. We don't necessarily know who who was all interviewed in this grouping to where these three coaching candidates have now made it out of the top uh, ahead of the other candidates. You know, a guy like Chris Quinn was someone that I was interested in from, from Detroit's point of view. I don't know how much he's talking to other teams right now. Uh, while he's, you know, dealing with the NBA playoffs, obviously Charlie Lee was uh, in Milwaukee, but it might be different for what Chris Quinn is doing in Miami. Uh, Ime Udoka definitely the, the the biggest disappointment of, you know, it never really sounded like Detroit had significant traction with him. It was originally announced when Dwayne Casey uh, was moving on that Ime Udoka was going to be a key candidate for Detroit, but we never really heard anything about him after that initial tweet. We never heard he interviewed with the Pistons. So it's disappointing, and now he's off the table after becoming the Rockets head coach, which I think is a great hire for them. I don't know who else Detroit could be waiting for in the playoffs. I don't know how, because Nick Nurse just recently left Toronto, I don't know if he's had a chance to start interviewing with teams yet. It feels like he's a coach that's going to jump into the next gig as soon as possible. Uh, and it sounds like it, it feels like he's going to get head coaching opportunities as soon as next year. So I'm not sure if Detroit's had a chance yet to talk to him, but it feels like he'd be another candidate. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily the right candidate for Detroit, but it feels like he's a coach that's going to get uh, opportunities across the league to at least interview for the head coaching position. And maybe he's a guy that steps away and does this, you know, as an associate head coach for a year or a couple of years under one of the, you know, bigger staffs, better staffs in the league. But Nick Nurse does have an NBA championship under his resume. And I feel like that's going to to buy him a head coaching gig again. Not sure it needs to be in Detroit, but it's I feel like it's going to be somewhere. And I feel like it's going to be next year. Um, Aaron, if I may, real quick. I my guess is he's going to be in Milwaukee as the next head coach. Yeah, really? That's, well, why not? I mean, Bud's uh, Bud's uh, gone, but Budenholzer's gone. That dude is gone. And if you're going to lose Charles Lee as your assistant, now maybe Charles. Now I, that's a, that's a question I have for you. Do you see Charles Lee as being a potential replacement for Mike Budenholzer in, in Milwaukee? Because I I'm working on the assumption Bud's gone. Uh, you can't you can't lose that series and keep your job. Um, so for me, I think Nick Nurse is the natural replacement. He's a guy who already has championship experience. That is a team that is still 100% going to be going for a championship. And I think it's an incredibly attractive job. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just wondering for you, do you think that Nick Nurse is a real possibility for the Pistons? Or, or do you see, because I really do think, you know, James Edwards III said in his athletic article that many GMs view Detroit as the most attractive uh, uh, destination for them. With Milwaukee's job potentially opening up, A, do you buy that Detroit is such a, a great free, um, excuse me, a great head coach destination? And B, do you think that Milwaukee has overtaken them, even if you do think that is the case? I, like, how does that affect the Pistons coaching search? I couldn't imagine choosing Detroit over Milwaukee. I, I couldn't imagine 
choosing a, a team that won 17 games last season over a roster that's won an NBA championship that has the best player in the league right now and has these guys under contract. Giannis, Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, they're under contract. Things did not go as planned for them. And, and I, I'll be honest, I don't know if, if Budenholzer's gone. I think when you win a championship and the factors that played out for for Milwaukee, it sounded like Giannis Antetokounmpo was not fully healthy. Like, I feel like that there's enough there that, I don't know, it just feels like Budenholzer is so well-respected there and is so well-respected around the league. I mean, he is one of the better coaches in the league. It just, I don't know. I It's certainly disappointing how the season ended for them. I don't know if he's gone, but if he is, that becomes the most attractive job in the NBA by far. By far, you're talking about being the, a team that was had the best record in the Eastern Conference, has the best player in the league, has won a championship before. They are the they are they would become the best uh, open position. And does a guy like Charles Lee, who's been regarded as one of the next uh, head coaches in the NBA, does he get to step into that? You know, do the player? I mean, that's got to be where Milwaukee's head immediately goes. If you uh, yeah, to make a change. I think that's a real question. I mean, I really, honestly, that was a great series, but I do think there's the potential that Milwaukee losing in the first round significantly affects the Pistons coaching search. That being said, I don't think Jerron Collins, I don't think Kevin Ali, especially Kevin Ali, um, are real replacement, you know, potential replacements for Mike Budenholzer. You're not bringing in a first-time head coach for a team like that. So, I don't know. I think I look at it. I, I personally don't think Nick Nurse is a who I'm interested in, and b necessarily going to be interested in coming to Detroit. You have to also wonder if Ime Udoka is <laughs> kind of kicking himself for for agreeing to be the Houston Rockets head coach when, again, a, a far more attractive job in Milwaukee could be potentially opening up as well. I mean, look, Aaron, I totally agree with you. Yeah, he won a he won a championship, but. Larry Brown was gone the you know two years after winning his NBA title in Detroit and going back to the finals the next year. And Budenholzer almost got fired the year they won that championship. Look, if KD's foot isn't on the line when he takes that shot in game seven, I think there's a good chance Mike Budenholzer loses his job that same season. So Ooh, it's it's going to be really interesting to, I think to see what happens with that Milwaukee position because it could absolutely affect what the Pistons are going to do as well as a couple other teams that are in the playoffs. You know, Taylor Jenkins, what, what happens there in Memphis if they lose to the Lakers? That's going to be tough. So I think that while we're maybe not entirely sold on the names that the Pistons are bringing in, I also think that there's a good chance that the guys they're bringing in aren't going to bail on them for another position. And I think that there's something to be said for that as well. We saw it last year with the Charlotte Hornets. Kenny Atkinson agreed to be their head coach and then said, eh, you know what? I'm good. Thanks. I'm going to head back to the Warriors. And I think with the three guys that you're talking about here, I see there being a very, very slim chance of that happening with Detroit. You know, organizational fit. The coach also has to be a fit for the organization and vice versa. So I don't disagree there. I don't disagree with that, that last statement at all. And the Pistons are said to, you know, not be in a rush to make this hire. They're gonna wait it out at least, it sounds like for a little bit longer, see what continues to happen in the playoffs, uh, see if anything any other shakeups occur. When I look at these three names that we initially mentioned that have emerged as the early front runners for, for the head coaching position, uh, I would rank them in terms uh, of my least favorite pick, Kevin Ali. My my middle of the pack pick would be Jerron Collins. And, and Charles Lee is, it would be my my favorite pick out of that group. And, and for me, it's the, it's the experience that he has uh, under Mike Budenholzer. It's the experience that he has uh, coaching some of the best players in the league, both on offense and defense. Uh, it's the, it's the, he's young. He is well-respected around the league. And we have heard about Charles Lee for the last few years now, where he started to gain momentum, where he's starting to pop up 
in more of these head coaching interviews. He was supposedly very, very close to getting the Atlanta job before Quinn Snyder got it. And, you know, to be, to be fair, Quinn Snyder is an excellent coach. And when you've proven what Quinn Snyder has proven, he's earned that job. Like it's tough to turn that down, especially when you're a team like Atlanta, who's in the middle of a season trying to salvage it so that they can make the playoffs. And now credit to them. They forced Boston to a game six that's being played, uh, you know, as we record this Thursday night, but they forced Boston to a game six. And in what looked like it was initially going to be a blowout series, they turned it around. And I think Quinn Snyder certainly gets credit for that. And Trey Young, who is a supposed coach killer, is out there giving a ton of praise and saying, you know, essentially Quinn Snyder's the best coach that he's had the opportunity to play for in the NBA. And I know I don't know how much that means. You know, you're a, 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 a Nate McMillan. <laughs> you're a victim of the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying Nate McMillan's uh, coaching strategy was outdated when he was with the Pacers. So, you know, it's not like he's had great head coaches with him, to be fair. But yeah, no, I mean, look, Quinn Snyder did an amazing job in Utah. You look at that team, the guys that have left it in the year, you know, Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert, both those guys just lost in the first round. So yeah, I, I think you Quinn have Snyder's to really give Quinn Snyder his props. And, and that's who I wanted, you know, we, when we talked about this topic, you know, in the middle of the year, it was like, hey, if Quinn Snyder's available, that's that would be the guy that I want the Pistons to get. Um, but Lee is, is my favorite for, for those reasons. Um, I don't, you know, I had people upset with, you know, me not being super into the idea of hiring Jerron Collins. Or I had someone telling me he's a hot commodity on the coaching market. He's had one interview each of, of the last three years, or excuse me, he had an interview 2019, 2020, and 2021. He didn't have a coaching interview last year. Uh, not a hot commodity by any stretch of the imagination. That doesn't mean he's a bad coaching candidate. It doesn't mean, you know, the Pistons shouldn't be interested in him. But let's not let's not try to, uh, you know, exaggerate where where he ranks. You know, he's, he's not popping up in every single coaching search, and he's not popping up on every team's interview list. And he hasn't been a head coach yet because he's simply not that yet. Now, his respect that he's gained for working with the Warriors, building out a championship level defense, like totally respect that. And that's why I rank him above Kevin Ollie. But there, there's something to be said with I feel like Lee has just garnered more interest across the league. And in recent coaching vacancies, he's been the name that's been part of the final groups, part of the final interviews. We haven't really had that. Uh, with Collins. And again, he might be a great coach. He might be the head, next head coach of the Pistons and he might build a great defense and, and be, you know, the, a, a former, you know, that next great foreign player. We're seeing it more and more where these former players become head coaches at a young age and they thrive after, you know, spending a year or two as an assistant, spending a year or two as a head coach in the G League. They get there sooner now. And it hasn't always worked out. You know, for me, I think of guys like Jason Kidd, guys like Derek Fisher, who, very early on post their their playing career jumped into head coaching gigs and they've struggled they they, they have now Jerron Collins is completely different he's a completely different person was a completely different player but I don't know enough about his experience to where I can say oh this is a guy that definitely a top candidate so that's where I'm at uh, like I said reports indicate that the Pistons are going to continue to wait it out and see what else happens in the playoffs to see if there are any on the uh, further uh, coaching shakeups I would imagine this team would like to have their head coach before the draft in June. Um, so they definitely have some time. And, and perhaps by the, you know, by the time the, the NBA gets to the the championship, uh, and, and, you know, to the finals, the shakeups that are going to happen will have happened. And the Pistons will, will be able to get the job done uh, in terms of hiring a coach, naming a coach, uh, you know, a few weeks, three weeks out, beginning of June before the NBA draft. But we'll we'll see there. Uh, as as time goes on any final thoughts on the coaching search and this initial yeah time? yeah I, I'm, I'm gonna just quickly play a, a little devil's advocate before we move on you know you talk about Jerron Collins a guy who's only gotten one interview in the last couple of years per year hasn't been a hot commodity versus these other guys that maybe be a little bit more of hot commodities and the thing I'll say about that is the, the the difference and the one thing that I think sets GMs apart from us as fans, analysts, whatever you want to say, 
um, they have access to the locker room. They have access to players' real thoughts and what's really going on. And while we are able to break down what's going down on the floor, uh, while we're able to perhaps spot talent better than some GMs in certain cases, we don't have that inside information. And I, I think about a guy like um, Ettore Messina, who's an Italian head coach. Uh, he, he coaches, I believe, for AC Milan still. Uh, but he was with the Spurs for a few years, and he was a really, really hot coaching name uh, a few years back. And he didn't get a job, and he ended up going to uh, Milan. And a lot, a lot of people wondered why that happened. I happen to know somebody that played for Milan. Ettore Messina is despised by his players. Not just at Milan, he was hated by his players on the Spurs as well, from what I understand. And those are the things that you can't quantify, that you can't say, you go, ah, you know, the guy got a bunch of, he should be this hot coaching candidate. Everybody's talking about him. He's getting all these interviews. He must be great. But the thing we don't have is that insider information. And it really is important in cases like that. That's why he didn't get an NBA job. And I think when you're looking at certain names that might be hot, certain names that might be not, Jason Kidd was a really hot name. How'd that work out? Not well. Um, you know, was, I'm not trying to think of, Quinn Snyder was not a hot name. How'd that work out? Really well. So sometimes I think, you know, while we have our favorites, I hate to say it, but I do think insider information rules when it comes to these coaching searches. And while I'm absolutely skeptical about a guy like Kevin Ali, I'm also willing to admit I don't have all the answers there. So, well, yeah, I'm just to play a little devil's advocate, not saying that you're saying that, but no, that's a hundred percent. Right. We, we know, we know a percent compared to the people in the league doing this every single day. We can only take the information that's accessible to us and, and yep. form opinions based on that. So to, you know, say that I'm, I'm coming out here or, or anyone, you know, I'm not saying that you're saying this, but the, the line of thinking, whereas if I'm coming out here, I'm not, there's no chance in hell that I'm able to, to formulate an, uh, an opinion on someone like Charles Lee more than an NBA general manager could. Yeah. The context that they have, the experience that they have, uh, the players that they know, the agents, the other coaches, the day, the day in the life stuff that they live and see and work with they they're in those spots for a reason. Even the worst of the worst are in those spots for a reason. Um, Absolutely. Like Aaron, there's a difference. Opinions because they and, and have these, you know, again, like, I'll be honest. I don't like the idea of Kevin Ali, Ali being the next Pistons head coach. But Troy Weaver definitely has more information and has way more resources to the point where if he feels comfortable making him a candidate and inter interviewing him, that's his prerogative. And you have to trust that he at least has done the work and knows enough where that's, that's okay. Like it's, he's, he's doing it. You know, he's not, he's not going to hire Kevin Ali just for shits and giggles. Like he obviously feels like he, he knows enough and, and, and is capable enough to be the next head coach. Uh, Aaron, you don't know that he could just be doing it for the lulls. <laughs> I guess he could. I guess. Yeah. Uh, watch me troll an entire NBA fan base. <laughs> I feel like he does. He's already done that, though. Yeah, yeah I do too. Centers <laughs> a year thing, but bring it, bring, yeah, bringing back Rodney Magruder and, uh, and and Corey Joseph. Maybe he is trolling us. I, you know what? I'm gonna give it up to him. If he is, if I see a YouTube video in a couple of years, I trolled the entire Detroit Pistons fan base. Props, mad props, dude. Good for you. Nah, I mean, really, Aaron. I, I think it's as simple as this. There's a difference between analysis and opinion. We're sharing our opinion. We're willing to admit that we don't necessarily have all the tools at our disposal to give accurate analysis in this case. But that is something that we certainly are going to get next year because the Pistons aren't going to have a new head coach, whether it's Kevin Ollie, whether it's Charles Lee, or uh, uh, it's the, the triple threat of Mike Angolano, Aaron Johnson, and Jasper Apollonia. Who knows? Hey, never, never say never. Never say never. All right, let's move into our second and final topic of this week's show uh I believe it was last week maybe two weeks ago now that the athletic nba did a poll uh, across the nba player base where they pulled on a multitude of, of different things you know mvp 
uh, you know, players that talk the the best or most trash things of that nature. One of the topics that they talked about uh, were the best and the worst fans and arenas uh, in the NBA. And the Detroit Pistons did not rank out well in that at all. They ranked as having the second worst fan slash arena experience uh, in the league, according to players with essentially the, the, the vibe from players saying nobody's there. Nobody comes to those games. How do we feel about this? Because I think there's, there's some reasoning as to why the Pistons struggle to have a great fan turnout, even though at the games that I were at this year, for as bad of a team as the Pistons are, I don't think the attendance was awful. And I felt like the fans were relatively engaged. Um, but still, they, they ranked out poorly against NBA players. And Jasper, I know you got some good information on this that, that you wanted to share. So I'm going to turn this straight to you to start this one off. Well, sure. I mean, you're totally right, Aaron. You know, I, I'm somebody I don't like to just listen to George and and Greg Kelser on, um, on on commentary. I like to listen to other commentary teams as well. I'm a broadcast journalism major after all. I like to hear uh, what other guys have to say and their styles. I've heard multiple times this year uh, other teams, uh, now, uh, uh, announced teams, say, wow, Little Caesars is really rocking. It, it, there's some energy in here tonight. And look, the raw numbers absolutely bear that out. The Pistons were 12th in, in total attendance in 2023. That's really impressive. But I think on the other hand, what you have to look at is that Little Caesars arena – is a one of the bigger arenas in the NBA. While the Pistons finished 12th in total attendance, they finished 24th in percentage of seats filled. And I think that that is maybe a little bit more indicative. For example, um, the Atlanta Hawks finished 18th in total attendance, but they filled 104% of their seats. So I think when you look at something like that, like you have to take into account that Yes, while Pistons fans are showing up because it's way more convenient than going out to the Palace, they're not filling the arena. And I absolutely think that that has to be something you're taking into account here. To be clear, I'm not crapping on Pistons fans. The fact that they finished 12th in total attendance is, in fact, a testament to the fan base. That being said, they also finished 20th in average cost um, of attending a game this year. And I think for a team that is dead last in wins for the last, what, four seasons combined now, three seasons combined, to finish in the top 66% of most expensive tickets. Meanwhile, the Denver, uh, the, the San Antonio Spurs, the Blazers, the Pelicans, the Kings, the Magic, the Pacers, all teams that have played better over the last couple of years than the Pistons have all finished are, are all below them. So I think for me, look, you're talking about an arena that's not full with fans that are having to pay too much. And this is the last part of it. And Aaron, I, I wonder if you have anything here anecdotally. I'm going to be honest. Pistons fans are very disrespectful to not only their opposition, but in some cases to their own players. I remember an incident a few years back uh, when a Pistons fan had to be escorted away out of the palace because he was talking crap to Andre Drummond during his free throw attempts. That's a Pistons fan who is doing that. I've seen multiple videos this year of fans saying, really, I mean, stuff that, I'm sorry, is is racially coded. I'm willing to say it. Calling players, boy, sit down, boy. The, you know, the way they're saying it, you, you know what they're saying. If you're a smart person, if you have any sort of a head on your shoulders, you know what they're saying. And um, yeah, I, I think that opposing team, uh, opposing teams, they don't like it. I think Pistons fans can be really disrespectful to them. We've seen multiple times this year where they've gotten to jaw jacking with fans and it felt really disrespected. So I'm not exactly surprised. Do I know for a fact that the Pistons are the second worst fan base or whatever in the arena of any team in the NBA? Absolutely not. But I'm not surprised by the ranking. That's, I think, really more what's clear there i'm sorry i i just i have a hard time seeing a, a fan base that fills the arena and is disrespectful to their own players and to opposition as being worthy of praise by 
those same players. Aaron, I don't know if you have a different perspective on it, but that's how I see it. No, I think for me, it's as, it's as simple as this. It's you're going to go down to one of the worst teams in the league, watch them play and lose by 10, 15 points. Your odds are you are likely going to see the other team if a star is in town. I mean, I for me, it was I went to the game against Denver late in the season. It was like I get to watch Nikola Jokic in person, a guy that, you know, one of the best players in the league. He's rarely plays in Detroit. Uh, I think this was the first time he he played in Detroit since like Andre Drummond was on the team. Um, so for me, it was more so about going to watch a Jokic in person. Uh, but you're going and you're spending all this money and the tickets are not cheap. For a bottom of the barrel team, um, you know it's not necessarily a, a very comfy arena to be in. I think the seats are are, are not, you know, they're small, they're tight, um, you know, they're, they're it's you're packed in there. And again, you're you're watching a terrible team. You're paying fifty dollars to park at one of Chris Illich's parking lots. Uh, you know, you got to pay twenty five dollars for for freaking Little Caesars pizza. Uh, you know, you're paying incredibly high prices for any sort of concessions uh you're paying high dollar for parking it's just and you're going to watch a terrible team I, I just think if people are smart with their money they're not going to watch the detroit pistons on a saturday night on a friday night when you know tickets are raised up even higher because they're the, the premier nights that the team's playing when they're going to lose i mean it's really just that simple. You really want to watch the game and, and you don't want to watch it at home. You can go out to a bar and have a much better experience. You can go downtown still and you can go to one of the sports books and probably pay less and have a better experience than watching it at LCA. It's not like they do anything crazy over there. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they, you can go hang out. And, you can hang out in District of Detroit, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, seriously, you can go. You can go to a sports book and 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 have a have a better experience. You know, you're not going to LCA for some amazing fan experience where they're doing giveaways. I mean, they don't, you know, they don't do like the tees for threes anymore. Like I want my brother. And uh, that was one of the comments he made. He's like, well, where's the tees for threes? I mean, when we, when we used to come as, as younger kids, like that was, that was half the fun is trying to get to catch a tee with you do tees for, tee for threes, tees for threes. When the Pistons would hit any three pointers, like that was, that oh, was the fun dude. part. Like, and when Eric, Oh dude, when Tom Gorris was in the house, just, yeah. Just wasted out of his mind on whatever he could pick up off the side of I-75. Oh, man, that was the best. Oh, he'd throw him into, like, the third row because he couldn't get it any further. Oh, it's awesome. I can't believe they got rid of tees for threes. And I, I might be mistaken, Aaron. They're raising uh, season ticket prices by, like, $400 next year. I, I hope we have some people in the comments who might know. I'd, I'd love to be corrected on that. I don't have the information right in front of me. But, yeah, I think it's a two-pronged problem here. One, I don't think the team does a good job of taking care of their fans. Somehow. I'm sorry? You've got to fund that James Wiseman extension somehow. <laughs> yeah, we got to pay Marvin Bagley, too. Um, yeah, no, I 100%. Like, I think there's a two-pronged problem here. One, I don't think that the team treats their fans well. And, B, I think, again, if, if fans aren't being treated well, I think they're less inclined to to a cheer really loudly, go all in, and, and b I think they're you're more likely to get people that you know are kind of just there to mess around and and are less about the love of the game because like you said you can have that's a better experience somewhere else specific to Detroit because it feels like across the NBA this year in general there have been way more incidents where fans are having to be escorted out. And are having, you know, yeah. being into it with players. I mean, I don't necessarily, and it, it it certainly has happened at Detroit. I mean, the Denver game that I was at, a fan got kicked out for talking uh, to Jamal Murray. So it's like I'm not saying it doesn't happen here in Detroit. It does. I'm just saying that almost feels like it's more so a problem like across the league. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, come on, look at the look at the Draymond get it when he got kicked out of the Kings game, and you just got all these fans flipping in the bird. I mean, I get it. It is what it is. And I don't want to paint Pistons fans in a light that is not accurate. This stuff happens everywhere. To be, I want to be crystal clear. Unacceptable incidents with fans happen all over the league. It happens. And I, it's not good in any situation. But I do think there is something a little unique about with the Pistons. 
where you are getting fans that are sitting courtside, second row, third row, that are getting into these big altercations with players that, again, I've seen multiple videos this year, and I'm watching them like, there is a, I, I like to talk trash. I've done it before. Uh, but there's a line you can cross, and there's a line you don't cross. And multiple of these videos that I've seen this year have really crossed the line for me in one way or another. So I'm not saying it's Detroit only. I just think perhaps the fans that are saying doing these things are a little closer to courtside. They're a little more vocal than they might be in other arenas. Because look, I go to a lot of Brooklyn Nets games, Aaron. I've never seen somebody kick, get kicked out of the second row, third row. I know of multiple incidents that's happened with the Pistons in the last five years alone. So, yeah, for me, again, I also don't put that much stock into it. I think the Pistons have a great fan base. I really do. And I think that it's more of a symptom of where the team is and, you know, what what kind of fans are showing up to the arena right now while the team is in the absolute doldrums of the NBA. So My I want to be really clear with that. Like, I'm not talking crap about Pistons fans because I am one of them. And I love talking crap. So, yeah. Yeah, my general vibe, just to kind of wrap this up from my perspective, is that for for how bad the Pistons are and for how um, unappealing of a situation it is to, to go to a, a Pistons game at this point, the Pistons are pretty lucky with the turnout that they get. And this is a fan base that every time that I, I went to a game this year was like, man, Imagine if this team was winning. Like this is a a fan base that wants to get behind the Pistons so bad, and I mean they want to get behind any team in Detroit. So sick of losing every year with in every professional franchise. Like this city is so ready to get behind a winner that I was at the Pistons games and I was just like, "Hey, I can't believe this many people are here for this bad of a team, and I can't believe how loud they are for this bad of a team." They're getting behind a, a, such a bad team because they are so desperate for this team to win. And they want to be able to buy into this team so bad. Like the vibe that I get is like this fan base cares and wants to be behind them. And I'm and I am personally surprised at how much they're they they were at games this year, considering how bad the Pistons really were. Oh, oh yeah. I, I here's my final thoughts on it as well, Aaron. Two things. One. I've been back in Detroit for four days. I've seen more Pistons gear in these last four days than I did, I think, at any point when I was growing up other than than um, when they won the championship. Like, I've seen more Pistons gear in the last four days. I'm, I'm kind of shocked. I, I really am. Because I, I, to be honest, I always thought the Pistons were number four in this town. They, the Lions are king. The Pistons are kind of last. And I think that that's kind of shifted over the last couple of years. And while I am willing to say, I think I understand why the Pistons finished second in worst, you know, in arena fans. I would not be surprised if when they make it back to the playoffs, that that is reversed. I really, I completely agree with everything you're saying. I think this is a city that is ready to get behind this team and if Troy Weaver and co can put something together, I think you're going to see exactly like you just said, one of the loudest, most passionate, most bought in fan bases in the entire NBA. And I hope that our listeners have listened to the end of it because I know, you know, we kind of went in on them at the very beginning of this topic. But I want to finish up with saying I really, really, truly believe that this is a fan base that can be one of the top five fan bases in the NBA. And that's not something I ever thought when I was growing up. I didn't think it was going to be possible. Um, yeah, they're not filling the arena, but guess what? They are still 12th in total attendance. So when you're looking at something like that, if they can get to filling the arena, if they can get these passionate fans in there, I think they have a real opportunity to be one of the best fan bases in the NBA versus where they are right now. Well, guys, make sure to run the pistons.com to sign up for your definitely uh, super cost friendly season ticket packages. Um, pistons are definitely trying to hook you up there with great prices for a great team, obviously. Uh, 
I can't believe I King's tickets are cheaper than Pistons tickets. They're in California. It doesn't what the make hell? It doesn't make sense. But I think that's where we should wrap it for this week's show, Jasper. Anything else you wanted to add? Hopefully we have Mike back next week. I know he's grinding out a few things in the real world, like a big boy adult, not something that I can really relate to. Uh, but hopefully we have him back for next week's show. No, being an adult sucks. Don't do it. I'm taking care of my dad right now. Don't, you know, don't let anybody in your life get old, Aaron. That's my advice to you. Just give them the old Simpsons injection and keep them at the same age they are for the next 30 years. Uh, it's <laughs> great. Um, yeah, no, I, again, I really hope that people listened all the way through. We're not crapping on the business fan base. We're not crapping on the coaching search. We're just putting our opinions out there and we love this team and we love this fan base because we're a part of it. So I, you know, I hope, I hope that our listeners are able to, to understand that um, we really are coming from a place of passion at the end of the day. Oh yeah. No doubt. No doubt. They're always uh, interested to see the reaction specifically in the YouTube comments when it comes to this show. I always get some very, very interesting, I guess is the the word that I'll use there. Uh, it's some interesting responses from from our listeners which we always appreciate but we really i i know it's funny because it sounds like we're kind of being like no we don't but actually i really do appreciate everybody that comments even if you have something uh stupid and mean to say to me that hurts my feelings and i think you're a big dumb dumb because you said it i still appreciate you i still love you so thank you for listening well that is going to do it for this week's edition of the palace of pistons podcast brought to you by believe uh, if you haven't had a chance to make sure to head to the website uh, betonline.ag today or use your mobile device and use our promo code BLEAV, B-L-E-A-V to get 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit with Bet Online from Aaron Jasper, Aaron Johnson. And Jasper. <laughs> Sorry, Jasper. I guess I just wanted to mix our names together there. No, uh, that's all right, man. Both of us, thanks so much for listening and we'll see you guys next week on another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast.